We're going to get into uh, JavaScript today, but before we do that, I'd like to talk about um, how you would actually put something that you created um, and make it live on the internet, make it a live website. And uh, we're going to cover the most basic uh, scenario here where we're just talking about HTML files um, because it, it can get a little more advanced with this when you're dealing with server-side scripting files. Um, first of all, the question of why comes up. Why would you want to create a website as a student to actually publish on the web? Well, I can point to a couple of reasons why you might be interested in doing that. First of all, as I mentioned, if you're interested in working in this field, there's a couple advantages of it. First of all, you can actually post and make available on the web your best work. And even if it is for classes, as long as you clearly label it as for class work, you could create and post an online portfolio, your online resume and things of that type uh, that you would be able to quickly show people that they could look at and, and see that that's something that you created and get a sense of what your skills are. Um, so to market yourself is a good idea. Uh, the one thing that, that employers consistently tell me when we meet with our advisory committee is they want people who are truly have a passion for this field and are really interested in going beyond the bare minimum. I mean, it's great doing your coursework and doing a great job on your coursework. But one thing that gives you a competitive advantage uh, over people uh, is if you actually go out and use these skills in a real world context. Now, you can get experience interning at some place. That's good, that's valuable experience uh, to have. Uh, you can also create a site of your own and it can be for your, you know, to market yourself like a portfolio. It can be for a club that you belong to uh, or organization that you belong to. It could be a fan site about something. You know, it almost doesn't matter, but you'll be showcasing your skills and you'll be putting yourself uh, a, a bit ahead of the people that just do the bare minimum because you'll be showing you truly have a passion for this and, and want to go beyond uh, what's absolutely required to do more uh, in this field. So that's one thing that that um, I would encourage students to do. Build a small mobile app if that's that's your thing. Uh, build a website. Do something that distinguishes you from uh, the pack. Um, being in a position to hire people in the past, uh, when you look at resumes, they often start to look awfully the same. All right. And I don't mean the appearance of them. Uh, I mean, the content on them gets awfully the same. People that go to school, got good grades, took courses, C sharp, Java, HTML, PHP, whatever. So anything you can do to distinguish yourself. And like I said, that includes internships, that includes uh, working on your own websites uh, will, will distinguish you and put you ahead of the, the pack. So, how do you go to make your website live, right? Uh, there's a few, uh, few steps that are involved, and I post what I think is a pretty good link that talks about this. Um, and some of these can be done in, in different orders, but first of all, select how you're going to create the page and, or, or site. The first option you have is coding. That would be doing like we do in this class, where you would create a set of HTML pages along with CSS and JavaScript. All right. Uh, this is the hardest option, all right, because you're doing everything from scratch. This is the equivalent of building, a, you know, of, of baking a cake from scratch, where you do all the coding yourself uh, to do that. You have the advantage of, uh, of you can do anything that you want with this, and you have the advantage that you'll be showcasing your skill if you're, if you're doing this. 
Some of the other methods that you can use to create a website, many of them are geared towards people who don't necessarily have the technical skills. Uh, like the second one, a, web, a website builder, sites such as Wix, Weebly, and Squarespace, where you can go and you can create a website and it, it walks you through the options of what you want your pages to look like. Um, it's easier, but you don't have the ability to do something custom and it's not really a good indication of your coding skills. The other thing is something like WordPress, uh, which is a content management system where you can put information in and it formats it into HTML pages. And there's actually a combination of these things. So for example, you could create a WordPress site and do some custom coding on it. Or you could do a custom coding site and integrate something from WordPress or whatever in it. Um, so those are your options to build a website. Prepare your content. This I would equate to uh, the next two steps, prepare your website content and design and build your site. I would equate to the process that we go through in doing our projects. In other words, plan the site, design the site. One thing I hope that this class uh, indicates to you is that good websites don't happen by accident. Good websites happen when you really think through the goals that you're trying to achieve and the goals that people visiting your site are going to be trying to achieve, because that's what makes a good website. All right is that you help people achieve their goals. You help people get the information they need from the website and, and do what they need to do on the website. So I guess that would be these two steps, preparing your website content and designing and build your site. So we talk a little bit in here, which is good because we don't really talk about this too much, but perform keyword uh, research. So, research the keywords that people will have that will help you help people find your site. Choose a name for your site. What do you want to be known as? www. What? All right. What? Subdomain do you want to use? Do you want to use a .com, which is the most common? But there's a .org, which is appropriate for organizations. So if you did something for a club that you belong to, maybe .org would be better. And there's a number of other possibilities uh, as well. Um, your domain, generally speaking, should be short and memorable. All right. Uh, Don't necessarily want a long name there or one that is confusing or anything like that, you know. So it should be short, it should be memorable, and it should let people know, sort of uh, summarize what the what the purpose of the site is. Use images and video content. Now, this is one thing if you're doing a site for real, the copyright laws are more stringent than they are for an academic. Project. So for an academic project, as long as you give credit to people that you've taken images from, it's okay. But in a, a real world site, you're not to use copyrighted material unless you got permission uh, from the user or unless it's uh, uh, licensed under a Creative Commons license where they give you blanket permission to use it and so on. Then actually you build the site. And again, this is more of the design phase where you come up with a, uh, a wireframe, you come up with a prototype, design your brand look and feel. Again, you want to, uh, you want to uh, make sure that your site has a consistent look, uh, both consistent from page to page and consistent for what your message is. All right. Um, if your site is meant to be fun, Make the site look fun. If the site is meant to be serious, make it look serious. And your choices of colors, your choices of fonts all reflect that. Uh, 
all ought to reflect the mood of the site. Implement an easy to navigate user experience. Navigation is one of the key things that makes a website either good or bad. You know, the typical criticism of a bad website is I can't find what I'm looking for on it. That's the one thing that is, is maddening. Uh, and it's one thing that it's, it's tough to get people to always understand that, believe it or not. Because I've heard people when I've critiqued their website say, you know, something to the effect of, well, that content's on there. And it's like, yeah, but if the user can't find it easily, then it doesn't matter if the content's there or not, then that content is lost for the user. So this is like the structure chart that we talked about. All right, now for actually publishing the site. If you have a name for the site, you can register that site for uh, a relatively small amount. Uh, you can, and you can register it for the people, uh, oftentimes you can register it from the people that are gonna host your site. Now, what do I mean by hosting your site? Your site isn't going to, or probably not going to live on your computer. You have your computer or laptop or desktop or whatever, and you create the HTML and CSS and JavaScript for that, all right? But for all the labs that you've created in this class, it doesn't mean that someone can go and find them on the internet because more than likely you do not have your computer set up as a web server, all right? What is a web server? A web server is a computer that is on the internet that accepts requests for pages and responds with the, the relevant web pages. So I may have drawn this diagram before in this class. If not, this will be the first. We have a client and by a client, I mean someone that's surfing the web either on a computer or on a mobile device or anything, really, a gaming console, all right? They make requests to the internet. I represent the internet as a cloud because the path that a request takes from your client machine to a web server, we don't really care about in this class. You study networking, you'll probably study that process. And the web server responds with a web page. Client makes a request. The web server responds. What does it respond with? It responds with a web page, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, plus other stuff. Now you've been working on your computer and you've come up with a bunch of files and you've tested them on your computer so they all work and so on and you're ready to deploy them. You need a web server to put your code on. So what you will do is you will typically employ a web hosting company. Now that web hosting company can also register your don domain name, all right? Obviously, domain names have to be unique. There can't be two www.google.com out there, all right? That's the whole idea of the web is that it's universal. We can all go to a page and we can get to it. It's not like half the world Google is one thing, half the world Google is something else. So you register your domain, domain name, and you can do this through your web hosting company. So you need to employ one of these web hosts. And what do you get when you subscribe to a web host? Well, you get access to a web server, someplace that is connected to the internet that people can request your pages from. That can either be shared access or dedicated access. Sometimes a web server can 
uh, handle multiple websites. Sometimes if it's dedicated to you, it will handle just your website. You get typically get so much disk space on the web server for your files to go. And you might get access to some tools like MySQL database or PHP or ASP.NET, SQL Server or whatever. That's a real important consideration in choosing a web server is what applications and what tools you're going to use to build the site. If you're doing just plain old HTML, then any web server will do because any web server can handle HTML page. But if you're looking at some more advanced things like server-side scripting, you're going to want to make sure that that option is available on the web hosting company that you're uh, getting. One of the tools might be a control panel that allows you to transfer your files to the web server because you need to do that. On your machine, they're not connected to a web server, and therefore people can't request them. But when you employ a web hosting company, you get space on their web server, and you can either use one of their tools or possibly other means to transfer your content up to the web server. Again, the more complex websites that use server-side scripting, whereas you don't send completed web pages, but you send programs up there, will probably and will likely have more configuration issues that you'll need to resolve on the web host. You could actually set up your own machine to be the web server if you wanted to. Generally speaking, people don't do that too often. Maybe some organizations do that have a big IT staff because you're responsible for, you know, if you do that, then you have to be on the lookout for uh, security issues and so on. In this scenario, if you hire a web hosting company, they're responsible for patching any security issues that, you, that might be found with the web server or whatever. If you're responsible for everything, then you need to do that. Publishing the site talks a little bit about registering your site with search engines, uh, even though that's not absolutely necessary. And then be looking ahead to the future. It, it, one thing I always talk about in, in all my programming classes, whether it be HTML or Java or whatever, is realize that when you when you create a website, it's not going to stay that way forever. You're going to constantly need to update it. Update it with new content. Update it with new features. All right. Um, and therefore, try to write your code in a way that's easy to change. So take a few minutes and review this content on this page and consider creating a website of your own where you put information out there to showcase your skills and to show potential employers that, yes, you're into this field. You're not just interested in just getting by, doing the bare minimum and passing your classes, but you truly have an interest in this field. Now, what is JavaScript? That brings us to our second topic for today. I talked about server-side scripting, and that is code that runs on the server side and that produces HTML. So not all HTML that gets sent to users is coded as HTML. Some of it is coded in these other languages which take data from databases and other places and integrate them and actually write an HTML document. JavaScript is code that gets delivered to the client along with the original web page. And if I was going to make a simple, maybe a little bit too simple, but a simple description of JavaScript, JavaScript is code 
that allows you to change a page without making a brand new request to the web server and refreshing the entire page. So JavaScript allows you to do that. The one example that I always point to is pull down menus. So if we go to LC's website, We request it. And how do you request a page again? You either you click a link or you type in the URL. We've requested that page and we've gotten back the answer. Now, if I put my mouse over one of these links, page changes. All right. And the page changes without making a request back to the web server for a new copy of the page. How do I know that? I know that a couple different ways. First of all, I don't notice when you request a page, you'll notice, well, this is awful quick, but if it's a little bit slower, you'll notice something on the status bar saying it's accessing the site. You'll notice at least a little bit of a flicker as it's reloading the page. But here, nothing flickers. That code just appears. So let's talk about exactly how this works. And it all comes down to HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Sort of for a form a triangle. HTML is the content. The structure of the page. By content, I mean it's the text, it's the links, it's the images. It's the thing that people visit your site to consume. By the structure of the page, I mean how is it grouped together? There's a header section, there's a nav section, there's a section, there's an article, there is a footer, and so on. CSS is responsible for the appearance of the page. And the physical layout. What I mean by that is maybe the navigation goes along the left side of the screen. Maybe the header is along the top. Maybe the section is takes up 80% of the width of the page and is to the right of the navigation and the footers at the bottom. This is what we've been working with all semester. We've used HTML to create content and to give it some kind of structure. And then we've used CSS to put that, um, put that in some visible form that's easy to understand, easy to use. These two work together, right? Because the CSS refers to stuff in the HTML. We can give a certain tag an appearance. We can give a certain class an appearance. We can give a certain ID an appearance. Now, the third part of this triangle is JavaScript. Which deals with behavior, specifically interactivity. Again, this is generalizing, but I think we'll find it true in, in most of the cases, especially the cases we're going to be looking at. And when I talk about interactivity, I mean the user does something and the page does something back in response. So the menus on LC's website are an example of interactivity. User puts their mouse over getting started, the page responds by displaying this submenu. User takes their mouse off, menu disappears. That's true for each of these sections. That's what I mean by interactivity. It does that by talking to and changing 
both the CSS and the HTML. Makes the page a little bit dynamic, changing. Can through JavaScript change the content on the page? Or we can change the appearance of the page. So we're going to start out small. Let's start out with some very simple examples to sort of give you the way that the recipe for JavaScript works. And then we'll get into more advanced examples. So let's pull down. first JavaScript example. And there's a JavaScript tutorial, by the way, you can go to that you can get information on W3 schools. W3 schools is a great site for beginners to access and to learn the very basics of things. I use this all the time whenever I'm trying to refer reference some stuff in HTML and CSS. So you can pretty much do it's anything. A, it's a good resource resource to use. So let's look at this example. Now, for simplicity, in these examples, I've put everything in one page. You can actually put your JavaScript in a separate file, just like you do the CSS. But to keep things simple so that we can see everything at one glance, I've put the JavaScript, the CSS, and the HTML in one file. Start backwards and let's look at spoiler two first. So we have our, our Star Wars spoilers. Who is Luke Skywalker's father and who shot first? We don't see the answers here. We just see the questions. As we put our mouse over these things, it gives us an answer. I'm not saying the correct answer, but it gives us an answer. So we put our mouse over that, we get an answer. Our mouse over that, we get an answer. That is a very basic form of what we have on this page. Put our mouse over something, something appears. We take our mouse off, it disappears. Except this is just a very simplified example. So let's look at the code that does this. And remember, these things work together. JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. So let's look at this, how the page looks when we initially load. We have our H1, we have our section, and we have a paragraph that says, who is Luke Skywalker's father? We're going to ignore all this stuff for a minute here. And we have a paragraph underneath it that has a class of spoiler. Likewise, we have our second paragraph and our second spoiler. So the HTML and CSS work to give us that initial view of the page. How does it work? Well, everything with a, every paragraph with a class of spoiler is not visible. 
it has a display of none. That's what that means. P dot spoiler. P means paragraph. Dot spoiler means a class of spoiler. Visual Studio Code is nice to show us a little example that that's what the code needs to look like for this style sheet to apply. So therefore, when we initially load the page, this paragraph and this paragraph is visible. Now that's an interesting concept and let's make sure we appreciate that and understand that. What we are saying is when this page loads initially, all the content for the page, both seen and unseen, get loaded. Much the same as in this case. When we access this page, all the content, all those menus get loaded initially. We just can't see them yet. So with this mouse over effect, the HTML that gets downloaded is all the HTML that could possibly be displayed. And some of the content is gonna be hidden. How can that content be hidden? Well, simplest way is by designating a class, for example, and saying every paragraph with a class of spoiler, we don't see as a display of none. So that's the CSS and HTML for the page when it initially loads. After it initially loads, the JavaScript adds the behavior to it. And the JavaScript does this thing in sort of three different steps. Number one, there are events. And events are certain things that can happen with the page. For example, the user can put their mouse over something on the page. That's an event. And we can write our Java code to kick in whenever that event occurs. We could also make it when the user clicks on something. When the user clicks on a thumbnail, uh, a new image appears. So we could do that as well. It would be when the user types something in a text box, something happens. But most of the events in JavaScript relate to things that the user does on the page, ways that the user interacts with the page. Second thing that is used is what's called the DOM. The DOM stands for Document Object Model. Document Object Model is simply the way that JavaScript refers to different things on the page. For example, when we put our mouse over the spoiler, take our mouse off, we want that spoiler to appear and disappear. We don't want the second spoiler to appear and disappear. We don't want the heading to disappear. We don't want the question to disappear. We want this paragraph here to appear and disappear. So there has to be a way in JavaScript to say, what is it that we want to do something to? And then we manipulate those objects change the CSS or the HTML plus a bunch of other stuff too. It depends what we're doing. We could have JavaScript that when you click a button, it performs a calculation. 
in which case forming the calculation would be part of one of these things that it does. So let's look at and let's find in this example the events, the DOM, and the manipulation of the objects. Well, first of all, on this paragraph, we have an on mouse over event and an on mouse out event. So those are two possible events that we have. We can Google and get a list of all the possible events. change, on click, on mouse over, on out, on mouse out, on key down, on load, and there's other ones as well. So on is an event. Notice it's an attribute of the paragraph tag. Let's look at this paragraph tag, because this paragraph tag spans actually a couple of lines. We have our lesson sign and a P. We have all this mess. And finally, we have our greater than sign to close this opening tag. Now, what is all this mess? It's two events. To tell the web browser what to do when something happens. On mouse over equals, this is the thing that's going to happen when the user puts their mouse over this paragraph. This paragraph has the event associated with it. This paragraph is the one that the user is going to interact with. We also do something when their user takes their mouse out of the paragraph. Now, if we look, notice that even if we put our mouse way over here, it shows it. Why is that? If you weren't sure, why is that? Put a style on the paragraph. Notice that the paragraph goes all the way over here. So if we put our mouse all the way over here, it works. What if we didn't want that to happen? What if we didn't want this mouse to show it if our mouse was way over here? Well, what designates the size of a paragraph? Well, the width attribute. So if we set a width of 40% of the page, now the paragraph only goes to there. If I put my mouse over here, no impact. But if I put my mouse over there, there is an impact. The rest of the statement is a combination of the DOM and changing the CSS attributes of this. And notice this in double quotes. Document means somewhere on the web page you want to do something to. Yet element by ID, spoiler one, says find the thing on the page that has an ID of spoiler one. All right, what is it? Well, it's that paragraph right here. What about that 
element of the page are we interested in? We're interested in the style of it. What about the style? We are interested in the display attribute, which is the same attribute that we set initially in the CSS. What about that display attribute? Well, we want to change it to black. Now, notice there's a couple of things in single quotes. If we use double quotes on the outside, we have to use single quotes on the inside. When we do something like this, we mean give me the thing that has the ID that matches this word right here. So, spoiler one. If you don't put it in single quotes, it assumes you mean a variable. This is what's known as a literal. We want literally the thing that has an ID of spoiler ID, or spoiler one rather, the thing that has an ID of spoiler one. Here we want to literally change that to block, not the contents of some variable, but the word block. Notice that the attributes up here and the attributes here are the same thing. This and this point to the same thing. This value and this value are the same value for the attribute. So if we were going to read this statement and sort of translate it into English, we would say when the user puts their mouse on this paragraph, find the thing on the page that has an ID of spoiler one change the display attribute of the style of the item to block. And what that means is it makes it appear because it's no longer no display. The display is a display of block. Now, when our user takes the mouse off of that, we do on mouse out. So what controls whether we show it or hide it is whether the mouse, what event occurred? Did the mouse go into that paragraph? Did it go out of that paragraph? When it goes into it, display it. Let's change the display to block. When it goes out of it, change the display to out. Get element ID works on the ID. An ID needs to be unique. That is, there needs to be only one thing on the page that has a given ID. Why? So we can point to that thing and make a change to it. When we say, give me the thing that has an ID of spoiler one, we're talking about this paragraph right here because it has an ID of spoiler one. There should not be any other paragraph on the page or, or anything else, not even a paragraph, anything else on the page that has an ID of spoiler one. This allows us to pinpoint exactly what we're interested in changing so we can make that change to it. Notice the code down here is identical to the code up here, except we say, give me the thing that has an ID of spoiler two. Now, those of you that have done programming before, We'll probably think and say, this code is almost the same as this code. And I'm repeating the code. Is there a better way to handle it? And the answer, of course, is yes, there is a better way to handle it. And we'll look at that going forward in our next couple of examples. We'll continue with these examples next week in lecture. In the meantime, I have a bunch of examples posted and try to work through as many of these as possible. Try to look at as many of these as possible. I have this example, which allows us to show the spoiler or change the color. So this question gets a color when the page initially loads. And when we click the link, or we click the button. It's doing something very similar, 
The differences is, the differences are that we're dealing with buttons and not paragraphs, and we're dealing with clicks and not on mouse over. We're also changing something else about this. We're changing the color. This allows us to show and hide a form, uh, not a form, a, uh, a menu on this page. Make the text bigger on the page or go to normal text. Nice little accessibility thing because we can, if someone is having vision issues, we can actually expand the page to make it easier to read. Some more things with menus here. I'm doing something with the form. Circle has a radius of two or 22. Calculate the, calculate something, the area of the circumference. Circumference is 138.16. Another example. We view photo gallery here. As the user clicks, puts their mouse on a picture, it changes the image we see. So we all probably have seen photo galleries similar to this. We're not gonna go in depth into JavaScript. We're gonna go just enough to show you the capabilities of it and give you some easy examples. You're welcome to go as far as you want to though, and I can give you assistance if you need help with that. We will be covering these examples in future weeks, uh, but again, if you have time and you are interested, go over these examples in advance uh, before we cover them. Are there any questions out there? All right, that's all I had today. We will either see you in lab or we will see you next week.